and welcome back to week three of Healthy Conversations Climate Care Edition. This week we're exploring the environmental impact of the food industry and because we can't cook together because of Covid and all of these food regulations, we jumped on Zoom to cook a meal together before coming back here and having a conversation about the food industry and what that looks like. So let's go over to that video first. Welcome back everyone. As the intro said, we're going to cook a meal together um, on Zoom because um, COVID means we can't cook for each other, but we can cook for ourselves. And then through the power of the internet, we'll then be in the same place eating said foods and having a nice little chat about um, our diet and how that makes an effect on um, the environment. So today I'm going to be teaching everyone how to cook like an aubergine and chickpea tomato curry situation. We've got our aubergines. We've got our chickpeas um, and all the other things. Ladies and gents, if you can begin, we've got our woks. We've preheated our ovens to 200 degrees. Um, and if you could turn your oven onto like a, a low, medium low heat and chuck some olive oil in there or other oils are available. And then um, we're gonna like slice our onions into pieces about this big. You want to cook your onions for low and slow until they're super caramelized because it will give you more depth of flavour and Ooh. if you're doing that you want to be able to actually taste the onions. Um, yeah, so if you've done your onions we're going to chop our aubergines. So, you have an aubergine, you're going to chop it lengthways this way and then you want to end up with like little quarters. How thick? Maybe like a right. centimetre. Ah. Okay. So, you have an aubergine chopped off the end. Yes. Then you're chopping it this way. Yes. And then you've got let me let me demonstrate. Come off the end. Go on, yeah. And then you've got your two halves like this. Uh -huh. With each half, you're gonna chop it long ways again. Yep. And then you're gonna chop it all the way up. Yep. So you have a bunch of pieces that look like this. It's quite like grassy. Do you know what I mean? Grassy? Like planty. I don't think I've ever yes, smelled Jess, before. it's a vegan meal. <laughs> On your aubergine on your tray, you need to put like drizzle it in oil and then put quite a lot of salt on it. The salt draw out like liquid or something like that. Yeah, look at you doing. Oh, okay. Once we've done that, are we chucking it in the oven? Yeah, chuck them in the oven. Gonna cook them for maybe like 20 minutes ish until they look nice and golden brown. So we need to chop our garlic. Okay, so we're crushing the garlic. Yeah. yeah, you want to chop it super, super small. Sorry. Or just use the garlic. Where's that going? In with the onions or just like, where, where do I put it? It will be going in with the onions soon. However, garlic burns very easily. Does um, it? So you want to make sure you've cooked your onions down enough before adding your other things. Um, so just like put that to one side on your chopping board or wherever it currently is. With the chickpeas, am I meant to like drain the water off? Yes, please. Well, we're on chickpeas already. Hang on. Just like preparation. Yeah. We're not at that point in this world yet. This is just built up and she's quick with it. Speedy, speedy. Speedy. You want to see some real speed? <laughs> it's because oh, wait. I don't like, I, I'm always hungry. So, if I can prep, it means the food's ready quicker, you know? Well, we meant to crop both the aubergines. Yeah. Yeah. Not bad. <laughs> oh, Dad. Um, if you get your chilies, if you're not good with spice, maybe remove the seeds, but also they're very mild chilies. So, you should be fine. Chopping them. Um, just chop them quite small. Like, kind of an inch of it. Like your garlic. Oh, I like your garlic. A whole chili, yeah? Yeah, unless you're not good with spice, then maybe. Okay, so I will just ignore the chilies. Yeah. There was once a chili farm, a uh, chili bush near the playground that I play at in Singapore. Uh -huh. One day I just decided to play around with the chilies. Yes. <laughs> And ultimately ended up rubbing them in my face. Or rubbing oh, my face. No. No. This agony trying to get back home. Oh. And then rub like I don't know what ointment in my face. Yeah, what do you even do in that? 
situation. You just, you just cry. Um, <laughs> yeah, and cry some more. And then <laughs> you, and you wash your face. Oh, and then you cry some more. <laughs> and then you apply some ointment and somehow the ointment works. And then you cry some more. Yeah. Not really not enjoyable. Would not recommend. Chili and the garlic, you can chop it together. So it should eventually look like this. We're putting the garlic and the chili in at the same time. Yeah. We're not doing anything with the chickpeas here, are we? No. Cool. Keep doing definitely... at the end. And the garlic is going with the onions. Yeah. Yes. Garlic and the chili is going in with the onions. Um, um, so you can go in now if you want. I will be putting mine in now. Once you've done that, you're going to add in your spice mix. So I already pre mixed all the spices. Um, yeah. So in there is two teaspoons of ground coriander, two two teaspoons of garam masala, two teaspoons of turmeric, and like half a teaspoon of cinnamon. You might want to add a little bit more oil if it's looking quite dry, but you want to cook like cook your ground spices till they, till they smell fragrant. Okay. And um, once you've cooked your spices down a little bit, add your tomatoes and your coconut milk. Oh, oh, no. I've, I've done what Ethan did. I've only done one aubergine. <laughs> um, you want it to be like a very light simmer. So keep turning it up until it does a nice simmer. Simmers, okay. When, when should I stop? The aubergines, I don't know. If they look nice and brown, feel free to chuck them in your curry at any point. You want your, your aubergines to kind of look like this? Yeah. Wow. Feel oh. free to add your chickpeas, if you are ready. Oh, oh. you can in chickpeas before aubergine? Yeah, with whichever one. There is not a preference to either one, to be honest. Can somebody describe a simmer to me? Mine's lightly bubbling. That's mm. not boiling, is it? Put it, put your camera down. <laughs> That's a simmer, I'd say. Nice. Beautiful simmer. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Watch out, watch yeah, out, watch okay. out. <laughs> John Cena. <laughs> You want it to like cook down for maybe like 10, 15 minutes minimum. And then you could you could keep cooking it from up to like half an hour. If you How want do it they to look thicker. How do Beautiful. They look? I'll just keep cooking it till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> till Sunday. <laughs> till Sunday. In like charred bits. If it's uh, your desired thickness, you might want to keep cooking it down if it's not like saucy enough. If it's not thick enough with five C's, don't <laughs> turn it off. I don't know my desired thickness. <laughs> Amazing, guys. Thanks so much for cooking with me. Jess is playing okay. up. It's going to be wonderful. Through the incredible power of the internet, we're now going to switch over to the hut, where we're all going to eat and have a nice little chat together. I can't wait to try this. Come on. I'm very excited. As you just saw, we were together on Zoom making this here food, and now we're here with with the food. Look at that! Um, how did you guys find it? Did you enjoy cooking your food? It was a great experience. I loved it. I'm enjoying eating it. It was fun. <laughs> it was good fun. I have to admit, at one point, Ethan forgot about one of his onions, and in my head, I was like, <laughs> amateur. I did the exact same thing. I did the exact same thing with my aubergine. So half of the aubergines in this are really nice and soft and really. Really digestible, and the other ones See, the other are one's very chewy. Like um, so we're basically just going to sit and have a conversation about the food industry and um, like what that looks like, how we can be a Christian in that space. So we're going to look at three topics, ladies and gents. Um, so our first one is looking at like the command that God gives us to rule over 
over creation, what that looks like and applies to the food industry and what we eat. The second topic is looking at the world hunger and the situations with that. And our last one is um, looking at the environmental impacts of the meat and dairy industry. Um, we're not trying to turn you all vegans. However, we are going to talk about like the negative impact that some things have. Ethan definitely isn't. <laughs> I was like, what? What is One this? Day. Um, so we're going to look at um, this whole thing of like ruling over a country, the country creation first. Um, so we're going to look at a Bible verse because we love we love to base things in the Bible. Um, I have my notes on my phone. I'm not texting. Um, so the first bit we're going to look at is Genesis 1 verse 26 and it says this then God said let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky over the livestock and the wild animals and over all of the creatures that move along the ground so um, this verse basically tells us that we were created in God's image and um, how I see that is actually this command is to act as Godward towards creation. So to um, rule over creation in a way that is loving, that is caring, because we know that God loves us and we know that God loves creation. Um, and ultimately, God is the ultimate control, he's the ultimate authority. But I just was kind of like wondering how you guys saw that command. How do you view that? Do you think that affects how you eat? And um, does it not? Like, where are you at with that? At uni, I wrote a, an essay about should all Christians be vegetarian? Should they all be oh, wow. vegan? And like in the Bible, we see Jesus eating meat, like Jesus eating fish and all of it. Um, but, and then lots of people take that word like dominion out of context and say that we should be dominant over them and like we should have control. But actually, all it really means is like stewardship and like, yeah. so stewarding the planet well. Mm -hmm. And I really like what you said then about treating animals like God would treat them and actually God loves all of his creation mm -hmm. and so we should be respectful we should be kind um, not abusive to our animals and um, that's what I think anyway yeah that's what came to mind like when you were reading out the Bible passage of like stewardship yeah the whole sense of being good stewards of the earth that God has given us that God has created and he's placed us in into that part and he's given us a role right he, he told us to take care of it and so why like taking care of something means showing love being passionate about it making sure that it's okay making sure that it's healthy um but then you look at the food industry or you look at you look at like these factory farms these what do you call them mega farms and it's it, it, it can be quite like like oh that's not really stewardship is it that's 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 more exploitation. like exploitation exploitation corporation Big money one, thank you <laughs> like you you can see where where the the company's mindset is very much profit money whereas from a, from a christian point of view it should be stewardship taking care of it caring loving nurture nature I think it's interesting what you were saying about like, oh, Jesus ate meat, so that means that we can. Because um, I find it, like, when I look at it, because like, I'm a vegetarian, and when I look at it in context, like, the reason why I think it's different is because when Jesus was eating meat, he was doing it in a way which was really respectful of the animals. Mm -hmm. Like, if Jesus hadn't killed the animals, like, someone else would have done, and it would have been in a way that, like, the animals would have lived a life, and, like, it would have been very different to how like what Daniel was saying about like the farms and stuff mm -hmm. and I think for me I struggle with the thing of like actually the way that we farm meat today just like it doesn't feel like it's respectful or stewardful mm -hmm. of that creation especially in terms of like when you look at for like beef farming like they're cutting down the the rainforest for that like and not only is that getting rid of a huge like natural habitat which like is not caring for that habitat but like all of the animals within that are not being cared for either so it's not just the cows that are then going there but it's also the orangutans and the wildlife that orangutans i feel bad for them <laughs> specifically um but yeah like the they're, they're losing their homes they're losing their lives just so that we can have like some beef i i find that hard to <laughs> to compare that to how jesus would have eaten meat mm. back in the day yeah, yeah, love the conversation because it makes me f think deeper than I probably would normally. 
Um, but what it th- made me think about in terms of, you know, being ruling ruling over the fish and sea, and everything that God's given us, basically, is thinking back to like why we pray over our food. It's like be thank. It's because we're thankful for it. Oh, and lovely point. I think if you're, we prayed before we yeah. sat down. Dear God, thank you for this food. Yeah, but like oh, you, you thank God for it, and yeah. it, maybe without intention, you thank God because you know it comes from Him, and that's yeah. the whole point of stewardship. It's looking after something that's been given to you and it's not yours. Oh, it's a lovely like, point. God's given us and provided us everything that's on our plate, but it's like treating it well. Like going back to the whole thing of like. I love like the example of Jesus. It's like that's why I always think about like farmers as well. When I talk to um, Fee about like f- the, the the cool idea of farming, it's like you take what you need and not like overtaking kind of thing. Then you make it yourself. And yeah, there's so many like images. I, I quite, maybe a bad imagery is. T- Do you guys know the movie Avatar? No, the one, the blue, the one yeah. blue people. Yeah. I know, <laughs> I know, like the, the blue people. In the world. Yes. yes, of course. But, actually, no. but there's an aspect of it. <laughs> there's an aspect of it where when they killed one of the alien deers they thanked like for the, like almost like it dying and treat it with respect like you know, the sacrifice and everything like that and i think there's a part of that it's like when you know when food is actually like thanking god for for that food mm-hmm. and actually reminding you know when you, you also pray for like the people who provided it the people who made it but when you go deeper do we really know who's been involved of getting that food onto the table i think that's where discussion is going to go to in australia the local um, the local businesses are always highly um, like you won't see a Starbucks in Australia because they're all about supporting local businesses, um, and so the way the, the the their relationship with nature and the relationship with food um, is something that I feel like we can look to. And um, the TikTok basically, the guy was taking a piece of piece of bark, and then after he had removed it. He said, okay, now I'm going to water the tree to show my gratitude and show my thanks and and to give back. Um, And I think how that would look like, how how it would look like for us to adapt that kind of culture, that kind of um, outlook on how we treat our food or how we treat nature is something worth discussing. I think, oh, so I was just going to say the word like dominion as well, it's really interesting how you're saying like you think that um, like the way that we've been made in the image of God and like what dominion means, I think it gets so taken out of context because the way that we see like leadership is actually quite negative, like you know like when we think of like kings and stuff, they weren't a great example of leadership and so then when we're looking at leadership and when we see the word dominion we're like right okay so we need to take control of this and like you know completely like get it under our belt and like we can treat it however we want whereas like when we look at how god is a leader like it's all about servant and like being like under the leader and like humility and so when we see dominion like and dominion in terms of like being made in the image of god i think that really challenges me in the way that I then look at how like I treat the world and treat the animals and stuff like that because actually the dominion there isn't about being in control of them or like you know killing them because I'm in control but actually because like I'm meant to be serving them and looking after them as like a servant leader. Yeah, this is I think what um you said Ethan about like why we pray over our food I don't think I've obviously we I do it and I'm like oh thanks Jesus amen like especially when I'm really hungry I just like say it because I have to not I have to because I feel like I should um I don't think I ever think more deeply into like what that actually means um and as well what you said Gina I don't think I've thought about that before um that whole thing of like let's let's be servant leaders to creation um because often we talk about servant leadership to other people but actually what does that look like um, in terms of our diet. Um, I'm gonna move us on, on to the next point, um, which is looking at world hunger. Um, because I think when we talk about food, we're actually, um, like we're super blessed to be able to have this food we cook together. We could all access this. We could all um, like have the resources to, um, to be able to eat. And every day we have access to food, but so many people around the world don't. Um, so I'm gonna read you a few um, Hunger Fast Facts is what they were titled on the website, um, just so we can kind of get a picture of what it actually is like. Um, so the three of them, it says, um, there is more than enough food produced in the world to feed everyone on the planet. But the second one is about two, about uh, 690 million people worldwide 
go to bed hungry every night. And finally, small farmers, herders and fishermen produce 70% of the global food supply, yet they are especially vulnerable to food insecurity. Poverty and hunger are the most acute among rural populations. And off the back of that, um, I saw another thing that said about one third of the food produced globally is wasted. Um, and actually that's higher in built up countries. So um, in the US it's about two fifths. So like 40% versus 33 and a third recurring percent overall. Um, so actually we have so much food yet so many people go to bed hungry. Um, and as Christians, we're called to love everyone. We love people because they're God's people. Um, in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39, uh, the classic one, it says, love, your Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, your, all your soul, and all your strength. And the, this is the first and greatest command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So as Christians, we're called to love everyone. But as we can see, so many people don't have enough of enough food to eat. There is enough, and we're not... Um, loving them in that way um what could our response be to that like how how do you feel when you hear all those stats um like what's your response to it i think it's really interesting that first fact that there is more than enough food produced in the world to feed everyone because it kind of makes me think of that thing of like how even like in terms of creation like god created this world so that it would perfectly like human life would be able to live on it and it's like everything is like the exact perfect conditions and it's the same with food and like that whole thing of like God being the provider of that, like Ethan was saying about when we, when we pray, and actually like, we we have completely disrespected that, and like our greed has meant that what God provided has been like shifted out of balance, so that then, like we're not, yeah, like we're not respecting the fact that God's provided the exact amount of food that we need. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? And I think as well, like loving your neighbour is such an important thing that actually, even. So like some of us are meat eaters here, some of us aren't, but actually the most important thing is that we love one another and that we're loving God. And so actually at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter where we land as long as like we're loving each other. Mm -hmm. And I think actually, using that word again, exploitation, sometimes eating meat or eating dairy or something is done is farmed in such a harmful way that not only are you exploiting animals, but you're exploiting the workers. And so even though biblically, yeah, you can eat meat, is it the smartest choice or like is it the most loving thing um and if you are eating meat is it sourced well or like is it do you know the story like something that you said ethan really struck me about um thanking god and taking the time to look at the background of your food like where has this food come from actually for me oh there's a little fly um we love you fly um, <laughs> um like some people it's very easy to be like this food comes from Waitrose, like it just comes off mm. the shelf. But actually, where is, what are the steps it's gotten to get there? And actually, is me, even is me picking like these grapes that aren't organic or aren't British, like is, is that the most loving thing? Um, I was going to say, it's not just meat. No, not like, just meat and dairy. And like when you look, it's like, it's like coffee, especially, yeah. and like chocolate as well. If it's not fair trade, the chances are it's probably like, there's some element of like human exploitation going on there. Like the fish industry is super bad for that. Um, and also like, it's interesting you said about grapes because I think Food Miles comes into that as well. Yeah. Of like, where is your food actually coming from? Because um, we might talk about it later, but like the carbon emissions involved in your food, like that's not just to do with like meat, that's also to do with your fruit. Like if your fruit and veg isn't seasonal, there's probably a lot of carbon gone into that to transport that to the UK. Um, and I think we kind of mentioned it in the fashion one, like the disconnect between what, what we're consuming and where it's come from. Yeah. And we, yeah, we just don't see that as, as when we go to the supermarket because it's just there and it's packaging. You're like, got it off the shelf, great. Yeah. Got, some, got some strawberries in the middle of December and it's like, how? Yeah. Like when you really think about it, how is that even possible? Sorry, I'm going to go back to Australia. Is that Australia or is it back? Is it here it's somewhere Australia. where I read uh, where they put like the story of the cow on the milk carton? Is that here in the UK or is that in? Australia? That sounds like that sounds like New Zealand. Or no, there's a company that does that. It sounds like New Zealand, but I get I know like, what you're talking it, about. It, it I've is, never seen it a cow is that story whole that sense of I know, it's like knowing yeah. where your food is coming from, and so yeah. like they they literally they paste the story of like oh this the, this is the name of the cow that your milk is coming from, this is where she lives she lives on this much land and stuff like that and so it's like oh i actually got to know where my milk comes from i'm like oh okay so like what's up bro 
um, is just kind of understanding where your food comes from. Maybe it, like, what can like like I can't start. I guess I can then look out for like using those kind of brands rather than just like the the like oh, I'm just gonna grab another carton of milk. Uh, going back to like the maybe the moral issue. Um, of course, like it'll be it. It's a hard thing to to do perfectly or to do it completely right. But I think in terms of if you're asking yourselves maybe why you're doing it, it's going back to that whole like loving your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind and loving your neighbour. I think maybe the loving your neighbour part is one we can probably connect to the most. Um, and there's a verse that, just as we were talking, brought me to uh, Matthew 25, verse 35 to 40. Uh, in the summary, it's, it's the one talking about... Um, were Jesus saying to the people like for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat I was thirsty you gave me something to drink I was a stranger and you invited me I needed clothes and you clothed me I was sick and you looked after me I was in prison and you visited me and then they said like Lord when, when did we do this and he replied truly I tell to you whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me and I think it's like putting that in act of like when you love others and you try to help them out you're also doing that you're doing that in part for God um, so that's a big part of like you know uh, the whole, they go hand in hand, the whole loving your, your God, loving your neighbor. You can't love God if you don't love your neighbor, and vice versa kind of thing. So, yeah. And especially, it's a lot easier to love your friends. And so, you can often, <laughs> swinging that spoon around. Um, and we can often, well, I can, I don't speak for everyone else. I can often think, I'm really good at loving my neighbor because I'm good at loving my friends. But actually, I think the real test and the real, um, yeah, I'm going to say, a real challenge is can I love my neighbor that I can't see and can I love my neighbor that I will never see yeah. Yeah. and actually that comes into play with the meat and dairy and like well food in general yeah. industry is am I able to love that person that I'm never gonna even meet wow that was a great great bit and um, that whole thing of loving your neighbor that you can't see I definitely really struggle with that um, so we're gonna go on to looking at um, kind of the specifically environmental impacts of the food industry so we're going to look at emissions and also land use and um, focusing a little bit more on the meat and dairy industry but this does apply to all foods because all foods in some way um, create some sort of emissions um, so I'm gonna again read some facts out um, so first one is the food industry creates between one third and one quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so if you don't know, greenhouse gases basically cause more heat to be retained in the atmosphere. Then it causes global warming. And that is that. Let me give you another fact, please. Um, so uh, when I was doing some research for this, I came across um, an Oxford University research project oh, that um, basically concluded that if you switch to a plant based diet, um, mm. so remove dairy and meat from your diet and um, you could cut your personal greenhouse gas emissions by 73 percent it's quite a lot which it? is a lot um that means um if you like switch to fruit and veg because um meat alternatives are great but they're also not great for the planet um however they are often less bad than meat and dairy even though their their emissions are higher because they're very processed um and in terms of land use um, meat and dairy farming uses a lot of land because animals need more space than vegetables. Um, so agriculture across the earth takes up about 40% of land use. So about 75% of that 40% is meat and dairy farming. Um, but meat and dairy farming only makes up 18% of global food. So basically, use a lot of land for a very small amount wow. of proportion of food. Yeah, yeah crazy. How is it? Good it's like so many percentages. I like that the ball really dropped at yeah. the same time. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, ah. So this small amount, you're telling me this small amount is causing this much. Yeah. So it's emissions. using this much, but we only get this much. Yeah. And if you think back to the wow. bit of like we've got enough food in the world, imagine how much more. more food if you if you swapped out all of the cows to make mm. plants. <laughs> swapped. Like the swap. <laughs> so say, say you took all the land that all yeah. the cows were in and really you stopped putting point. cows there and instead yeah. you put yeah. you put Fruit. like fruit, veg, any like, like, like plants, Corn. imagine how much more food you like, that's it's true. insane. No one will yeah. be hungry anymore. What was it like, um, uh, a meal with like a burger, if you had a burger, but then you had two peanut butter sandwiches, same amount of I proteins, microcarbs, <laughs> mi mi micronutrients, <laughs> and same amount of nutrients, but like, like is is peanut butter compared to like 
a burger, like a cow, right? So like, basically, what you were saying. Yeah. No, but right. that's a, a really good point because like, mm. there's lots of people way. that feel like because you two both gym um, and it's <laughs> there is a massive misconception that actually you need to eat all of this meat to get your protein yes. in order to bulk. But actually, I saw this thing because I used to be vegan for like two and a half years and I used to follow like a load of fitness people. And they, there was this one guy in particular, he was like, look at the biggest animals on the planet, elephants, rhinos, yes. gorillas, they don't yes. eat meat. Mm. And I was like, wow, do you, do you really they're love proper strong, aren't proper they? Strong. Take it from, take it from um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, is he a vegan? He's a ve he, he's, he's dairy free these days. Well, dairy, uh, meat, free, meat and dairy free. Um, <laughs> So and vegan, now he is. <laughs> and the most the, in, the most interesting fact is, and it could be something to do with like just culture. Yeah. Because when he was in his prime, like what, how many years? Twenty years ago, something like that. Yeah. Um, he I was he like was he was doing on. like Subway commercials. He was doing yeah. Burger King commercials. It's like like oh, tough guys eat meat, right? But now the the conversation has changed to like like bodybuilders or or just like people like like celebrities like lewis hamilton for example right he, he's gone vegan um and it's like athletes are going vegan etc so etc et on the inside as well exactly as looking healthy. healthy on the inside and so i think like now is such a good time to be able to educate everybody on like the benefits of eating a having a plant-based diet rather than a meat-based diet. I think that education is so is so important though because practically when you're looking at it, it's actually like quite a privilege for us to be able to become vegan. Like yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Even for me, like yeah. one of the reasons why I've never gone completely vegan is I don't have the time to sit down and look at every like I know that I need all these different nutrients. Like it's like you know like you need calcium and stuff. Like when I don't eat as much like dairy and stuff. I notice I get the little calcium spots on my nails because I know that I'm not having enough calcium. And so actually it's a real privilege to be able to go vegan and be healthy at the same time because you have to have that time to like do the research yourself because no one's talking about it. Um, but if you were to like um, educate people in it, you would have so much more like, it would be so much more accessible for people. Yeah, I'd love there to be more of like balance is okay as well. Because I feel like you get lots of people that are split. So it's either mm. you have to eat meat, like yeah. you have to, because if you don't, then you're Flexitarian. like, yeah, That's like if you, if you don't eat meat, then you're not like a real human or like blah, blah, blah. But then you also get people that's like, well, if you're not vegan, I can't be around you. And it's yeah. like, vegan where teacher. is the loving your neighbor? Yeah. Vegan teacher. Where's the loving your neighbor? So She's actually it's guy. all about doing your best yeah. and all about just, yeah, loving people, Yeah, I think. I think as well, you know when Ethan, you were saying about like the motive behind it, like that's so helpful as well, in terms of like, why are you, why are you going vegan, why are you going veggie? Like that's gonna be so much more helpful than if you just are having the pressure. Like, yeah. oh, I did it because all of my Someone friends are vegan and I feel peer pressured into it. Like that's never gonna end well. And you're yeah. just gonna feel resentful about it and not enjoy yeah. eating food. There's so much power in educating yeah. yourself. Also, um, like, like, not to like, discredit Arnold, it's probably a lot of his education, he knows the benefits of being vegan, but there's a big part also that as you get older, it's a smart decision to like eat less meat mm. anyway. Yeah. Um, just because like your bodies won't be able to break down meats as, as you get older, the way to say it. I didn't know that. That's why like, um, oh, we, all the we, all really we all did, we all did so much. You just don't, you don't need as much, because <laughs> everything has its purpose. Yeah. Mm. Um, I'm, if you guys ever watched that Zac Efron series, yes, uh, it was so well, we good. But he drank a lot of renewable resources. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he went to Italy and he went to like longevity. Mm -hmm. so, like, yeah. they got the, yes, the, the biggest number of like people over 100. A tiny meat. little village in Italy. Yeah. And their diet oh, base is like very, very little <laughs> meat. And it's because like when they get older, they just don't need that much meat. Is it a bit like milk? Like when you're a kid, you need to have milk for the calcium yeah, because you like you're grow. growing your bones. Yeah, but you're like growing. now when you're like 19, like the milk isn't so... That's interesting. Yeah. Huh. So there's a big wow. part of that. Yeah. I don't know, like another part of like in terms of fitness. Also, like you can eat too much meat. Simply having a conversation with, with you and also um, looking at, for example, there's a YouTuber out there called Mark Rober. I don't know if I, I thought you said Mark Roper. <laughs> yeah, if yeah, anyone I goes to think. HTV, Mark Roper, different people. Nope. He's not a YouTuber. Mark Roper. He might be. Um, yeah, R-O-B-E-R. -E uh, he does like science stuff on YouTube 
and he basically introduced fake meat to Bill Gates and then Bill Gates and him had a conversation about uh, literally this emissions and um, the food industry and the meat industry and um, it, he was basically just cutting down the amount of meat you eat not going fully vegan but just cutting it down will reduce your carbon footprint by a lot a lot right yeah. Yeah. 50% Significant is amount. a big number right <laughs> um, and so like these days I try to I try to eat less meat I try to at least have or I try to keep my meat intake to one meat meal a day so like either lunch or dinner is veggie um, and and like that's and it's good it's, it's easy it's very doable for me um, will I ever go vegan don't know but um, like for example this curry delicious I already know I'm not gonna have any like I get bloated very very easily like I don't feel bloated at all I feel healthy I feel full um, and it's like, I feel like you could conquer the world exactly but if I have steak, you know, I'm already like uh, 45 minutes in, I'm like, I'm bloated. It's actually right? so true. I grew up just with like the whole food coma is a, like an actual thing. Yeah. And it's the whole, if you don't know what food coma is, like just the whole ex worldwide accepted thing that after you eat, you need to lie down because you feel tired, you feel groggy. Mm. When I was vegan, I never had a food coma. Because mm. it was just oh, like, wow. actually, okay. when I, the food I was eating wasn't making me feel like, oh, I need to lie down. Yeah. But actually... It was like, actually, I feel energized and I feel yeah. like I don't need to now have a break from my lunch break. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Wow. I've never yeah. thought that before. Food, food fuels you. Um, I think that links well into our final question. Uh, like, full, food? Food fuels. That's what I tried to say. Um, I think, fin like, finally, after this conversation, does it change your opinion on food or um, kind of what you said, Daniel? Like, what, where are people at? It's fine if you don't feel like it changes anything if it's um, like it's, we're all on a journey, right? Like I don't think it's ever, everyone needs to be this or everyone needs to be that because we're all different. We all um, get convicted in different ways. Um, but like to close, what, where are you guys feeling at at the moment? Let's go, start with Ethan and we'll go around. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is to learn on the people consequence that food has. I think my f relationship with food is already very much like I love food, but it's also very like I want to say mathematical. Like I, I will only eat what I need to eat. Basically, that's the relationship I have with my food, which is hard. We live in an Asian family, which like love to feed you, but like, I know how. Like if, depending on what I'm doing that day, I will eat accordingly, and eat. I will try not to eat anything more or anything less. Basically, that's just like just the relationship I have with the food, which I think has its benefit of like there's no wasted food. Um, I use what I need to basically. Um, but very much, I think the thing I need to pay attention more to is like, where is that food that I'm consuming? What's been a part of it? Who's been a part of it? And is it hurting people, basically? I think that's the biggest part, because I don't want to contribute more to that. I don't have to, basically. So, yeah. I'm interested to look more into like, seasonal fruit and veg. Like, I'm more, I already don't eat a lot of, well, I don't eat meat and I don't really eat dairy. But um, I think, I mean, I don't do the shopping in the house I live at, but I think when you do like get like strawberries and stuff in the middle of winter, like where is that coming from? And I think I'm yeah going to be more conscious of like seasonal fruit and veg. And it's nice because you then get like that rhythm of like you can look forward to the summer because you know you're going to get courgettes, or look forward to the autumn because you know you're going to have. Yeah. I like that. I think for me, I I that bit of. Let's find a middle ground. I think I'm very, I can be very hard on myself when I'm like, I really want an egg and it's from the chicken down the road. Like I'm gonna have the egg, um, but that also being conscious of where my fruit and veg is coming from. It's so easy. Just, you know, just like, I don't want this because I like this meal. But actually, where's it from? Like what's, what's the steps it's coming from? Yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Yes, when I was vegan, I did like the whole no honey stuff and I well I tried mm -hmm. yeah because it comes from like bees and stuff but I did find this honey so I live in Putney and then I found a honey that was um, produced in Tooting which is like very nearby oh, wow. and I was like wow that is so near and it had a little story about like the woman no, who yeah. had like written her name on it the woman that had taken it yeah. I think I got it from Q or something like that um, and I was like actually there's probably quite a lot of benefits in this 
Yeah. And I know the woman. And so I did eat it. And I was like, I'm not going to feel bad about this. Mm. Um, so yes, I back that. Um, something that I... Something that I'm really challenged about is the no, the, the waste. That number has really mm, struck me. Because yeah. yeah. I'm... My love language is feeding people. And so... I have this thing in my head that if my family come over and they finish all of the food that I've given them, it wasn't enough. Because I'm like, there oh. needs to be surplus so I know that they've oh, had wow. the okay. choice yeah. to eat more. But I'm so bad at then using that food. So I think I need to, yeah, and then because they then leave and it's only me that eats it, I can't eat for six. I can try, but I can't like. It and goes so bad I think, before you yeah. finish. So I think I need to get better at I think it, I just need to look inward and be like, actually, they know I love them without yeah. me needing to see it. Do you know what I mean? See it yeah. on the plate. So yeah, that's really challenged me, the food wastage. Yeah, I mean, I talked about it a bit, but I think for me, I'm kind of in, in the process of moving away from this whole mindset of you have to have meat for it to be a meal. Um, and I've thought about I'm half German, I'm half Filipino, and um, like like the Germans love their sausages the Filipinos love their pork like Bakwa sausage at, was, win at winter wonderland hits different exactly so <laughs> right? and, and it, it's it's very much I grew up in a house and nothing against my parents I love them to bits but every every single meat uh, every single meal that I've had growing up would always have some sort of meat in it and so I always grew up thinking that it's normal for like it's not a meal if there's no meat in it. like even if i got a salad i had to get chicken bits in it right and so um for me i'm at that stage where you know what it, it can be a meal even if there's no meat in it and i'm trying to move away from that and and trying to retrain the way my outlook on meals on food on like hey you don't actually have to put meat into this meal. Like, you're, you're, you're fine. Thank you guys so much for having this conversation with me. Oh, Thank, you for for listening. Thank you for wonderful. teaching us how to cook. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's delicious. It was really good. Actually was. Mm. They're not just no. saying it. Finish no. it all. Here. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> what a great conversation. And that was some really good food as well. And as always, we've got some challenges for you guys. Um, the first being, we talked about food waste. Why don't you try making sure that the food that you're buying this week is only the food that you're definitely going to eat. Maybe chat with whoever buys the food in your house and see if you can make sure that there's no food waste by the end of the week. And our second challenge is why not try be vegetarian for this week? See if you can find some new meals that you're going to love and you're going to keep in your diet. Linda McCartney, guys, get on it. Um, and the third one is why don't you try going vegan? It sounds scary, but actually the meal that we made was vegan and really, really nice. So why don't you give it a go and let us know how you find all of these challenges. See you next week. <laughs>